first, do you know the difference between an archaeologist and a paleontologist? Well, let's see. They both dig in the ground looking for things from the past, right? Well, it's the type of things they're looking for that make them different. You see, archaeology is the science of understanding human cultures, while paleontology is the study of prehistoric life forms. So basically, man, archaeologists spend their time trying to understand human history, while paleontologists generally look for fossils from before human history, like dinosaur bones. <laughs> Got it? Luckily for archaeologists and paleontologists, tons of help is now coming from NASA. How? Well, one of the ways is through the use of remote sensing techniques. Remote sensing? Well, in the broadest sense, it's the use of a device to collect information without actually physically touching the object. Now, a great example of a remote sensing device we use every single day are eyes. Think about it. You can detect objects around you without physically touching them. You simply use your detectors, or your eyes, to see the object, gather information about it, you're using remote sensing. There are many forms of NASA-sponsored remote sensing devices that are being used to help in archaeology and paleontology. Like, for example, there's something called ground-penetrating radar. This unique type of radar system can actually see objects in the ground without anyone having to dig them up. By using this, in combination with aerial photography and historical documents, NASA can help give researchers a much better indication of where to dig, what to preserve, and what areas to avoid. Satellites are another type of remote sensing tool being used by NASA researchers to help archaeologists and paleontologists. In fact, NASA archaeologist Dr. Tom Seaver has been using satellite data to help us understand why the Mayan civilization in Guatemala collapsed and how current populations may be able to prevent future disaster. Let me try to break it down for you. Between the 3rd and 9th century, the Mayan civilization in Central America flourished. But after about the 9th century, they collapsed, leaving archaeologists few clues as to why this once mighty civilization disappeared. This is where NASA comes in. Our remote sensing satellites can detect even small changes within the electromagnetic spectrum. So sand, cultivated soil, vegetation, and rocks each have distinctive spectral signatures, which are easily distinguished from each other. So archaeologists can use info from the remote sensing satellites to quickly target specific areas of interest, then send teams to that area to validate the findings. Dr. Seaver and his team have already found several previously undiscovered sites and feel confident that they know where others are, thanks to NASA's remote sensing satellites. That is how NASA is helping researchers find old ruins. But remote sensing satellites are also helping us understand why the Mayan civilization may have disappeared. Today, the Patan rainforest in Guatemala is covered with trees and is not heavily populated. But it was not like this during the peak of the Mayan civilization. In fact, during that time, this region had a population of about 2,000 people per square mile, which is about the same as current day Los Angeles. With a population that large, the Mayas had to farm huge areas of land. To do this, they employed a technique called slash and burn, which eventually destroyed virtually every tree for hundreds of miles. Computer models show that as the trees disappeared, so did the rain, which caused temperatures to increase by five to six degrees. All of these shifts may have caused malnutrition and disease, which in turn contributed to its collapse. This information is especially important for us today because slash and burn techniques are once again being used in the areas that were once Mayan strongholds. Understanding what happened to the Mayas may dissuade current generations of farmers from following the same destructive path. So, as you can see, NASA technology is being used for a lot more than just to help us in space. It's being used to help save lives back here on Earth, too. How proud we are. How fond to show our clothes and call them rich and new when the poor sheep and silkworm wore that very clothing long before. Amusing, but not precisely true. For only in the long dead days of prehistory was man content with raw fibers of nature. In the beginning, he sought to make them more interesting and more practical by interlacing or weaving to beautify them through the use of primitive dyes. Later, of course, he went much beyond that. 
he began to search for new and more versatile fibers, for new and better ways to improve older fibers. Man is never satisfied. He has an unquenchable thirst for progress. And out of this yearning have come some of the most dramatic advances of civilization. The story of this never-ending search for better materials to weave into a better life. Now, a woman would most likely have four, maybe, maybe five, but that's pushing it, different, basically, outfits. The women wear this all the time. With men, it's less and less common to see them in this traditional dress. Now, other items you might see for men, their traditional bag, and it wouldn't be decorated as nicely, this was a gift, but for men, their traditional bag is a morale, which is like this, that they would just wear like that, and that's what they would have. Women tend to carry a type of napkin. It could be large, like the one I carried all my weaving things in, if it was for going to the market, or it could be small, if they just were going to buy something small. This is woven in the same way. It doesn't have any designs on it. The color variation has just come from the way they arrange the strings. So these work in several ways. You can put things inside, obviously, to wrap up and carry. And so if that was the purpose, the woman probably just walks down carrying it like this. It's also common, especially in older women, for them to cover their heads at church with a piece like this. And then also because women carry items on their head, it also works to cushion whatever that item might be. So if you fold it and then take it and roll it, you can make a flat circular surface that when you put it, sit on your head, it softens whatever you're carrying. So when we talk about weaving, this is the origin of any of the other pieces you'll see over at the table later. It all started with this as its purpose, even though it's been adapted to other things. The story of fibers has a beginning shrouded in time. Somewhere centuries ago, on a misty riverbank, a hand began to interlace the spikes of river grass or reeds and plate them into mats that would provide a primitive type of body covering. Now, at this moment, civilization took a giant step forward. For from this simple discovery, the fact that natural materials could be plated together was born the art of weaving, a way of making primitive clothes, fishnets, baskets. In his persistent search for materials that would provide covering and decoration, primitive man was constantly experimenting. The gay plumage of birds attracted his eye. And in South America, and the Hawaiian Islands particularly, the art of feather weaving developed. And with infinite patience and skill, garments of breathtaking beauty were fashioned. In Samoa, the bark of the taffa tree was soaked, then beaten flat to produce a cloth-like material that could be used for draping and clothing. Now, this little handbag found in the grave of an Egyptian woman who died 3,500 years ago, is made of plated animal hair. Pendants of vines from New Guinea, and from Hawaii, this necklet, woven of human hair. But neither feathers nor bark, vines nor hair, could be readily spun into thread. And so man continued his search for a better fiber. Now, if we had a microscope powerful enough, we could see that the molecular structure of a fiber resembles a chain of beads. Each molecule hooks on to the one in front and the one behind, forming a long, continuous chain. Naturally, all fibers are not alike. Only a few can be drawn out, twisted, and spun to make yarn. After centuries of trial and selection, man found four natural fibers best suited for his purpose. From the vegetable kingdom came flax to make linen and cotton, best known of the natural fibers. From the animal kingdom came wool from goats and sheep, and from the cocoon of an insect, 
delicate silk. Nature provided the substance, but man provided the genius. This is a spindle whirl, the first textile device ever invented. A stick, a stone, and a clump of fiber. And yet by it, raw fiber could be drawn out and twisted into usable thread or yarn. The development of the spindle whirl was followed by the invention of the loom, making possible the weaving of cloth by mechanical means. And these two discoveries have left as deep an impression on history and civilization as any other development in the annals of man. For with the tools at hand to make cloth, with man's insatiable demand for textiles, men could no longer depend upon the wilderness to supply their needs. They took wild things and domesticated them, sheep and goats for wool. Man became a shepherd. The cotton and flax might grow in inaccessible places. Men learned to transplant the seed and husband the soil. And this was farming for fiber. And while some worked the fields, others spun and wove and dyed the cloth into marvelous colors. Still others became traders, exchanging their goods for other desired commodities. In this way, fibers became a potent civilizing force in history, helping create not only villages and towns and cities, but the roads between them. They became a stabilizing force for society. They created skills. They provided goods and wealth. They caused man to grow. So, as I mentioned with the lifting of the strings, that's actually the more difficult part. And when you look at the beginning of this, you'll see there are like, looks like gaps. And that's because when I was lifting, I couldn't lift it clean. So, that piece was very difficult for me at first, and that's what you'll see. You'll also notice that the distance at the bottom is wider than at the top, because as I got better and was tamping it down, more evenly, then they became narrower and more tightly woven. You'll also be able to notice the edge. When you put the shuttle through and you pull too hard, then it kind of it'll suck it in. If you don't pull enough, then it leaves kind of this loose gap, and so you can also see my struggle with that. And then, you know, so this was an example if you don't lift the strings. You have First, this stick with the strings that have separated your two groups. So, I mean, you can come as close as you want. <laughs> so, you can see if you look close that this will go around one and then leave one, and then it goes around a group and then it leaves a group, and it goes around a group and then it leaves a group. Even has some little knots on there. <laughs> Then you also have the two that divide for the designs, and both of them were separated first with strings just to make sure, and then the stick was stuck in. And then the bottom one. And you have the other. Okay. So it has, it has string, I already put the shuttle through. Right. So this comes down over the top, and if you just shimmy it, then you get the design group that comes up, and this goes in. Okay. So I showed some people, I had one of the zigzags on here that some people were trying before. So I'm going in this direction. Now you can see that here were the four. These are the four from the last one. Now to make it go in this direction, I just go one over. Okay, and then you just pull them up. And they just get wrapped like this. So same thing. If you want it to go straight like these, then you go every other time. Because every other time, you'll have the same group again, and it'll go straight. So here's the four, and I want to go over one for each one. So I go over and wrap it. 
Though jungle and drift sand had erased almost every trace of the site, these treasures began to come to light. A trench dug from the foot of the pyramid through the heart of the northern mound showed that the center line indeed must have had some magical significance in Olmec religion, for precisely along it lay many of Laventa's most impressive and mystifying finds. Among the first encountered were several tombs, presumed to be the burial places of priests. The most imposing of these was fashioned of basalt columns atop the northern mound. Here was early evidence of the value which the Olmecs placed upon jade. This structure contained vestiges of two burials, each accompanied by a cache of precious jade objects similar to those found in the other tombs. The jade was skillfully fashioned into celts, figurines, beads, ear spools. The work, as well as the precious material, a salute to the departed dignitary. Laventa's tombs all dated from the fourth or latest construction phase, suggesting a build-up in ritual activity over the centuries, and perhaps an increase in the prestige of the priesthood. Not only the tombs had been placed so accurately along Laventa's center line, but also monuments and offerings of the three earlier periods. Here, a magnificent stone sculpture was found, the so-called Ambassador Monument. What may be early forms of calendrical glyphs or picture writing occur on this sculpture. On the left, a footprint. On the right, an oval design, a clover leaf, a bird. Here in the central plaza, the most important ritual activities of Laventa are presumed to have taken place. Barely protruding above the surface before excavation, were some of the basalt columns which enclosed the court. Its dimensions were estimated at 135 by 188 feet. The columns had been added in the last building phase, perhaps as decoration, but more probably for privacy. The thick court floors, renewed each century, were by then nearly as high as the top of the phase two encircling wall. Here, we assume, the priests performed sacred rites guaranteeing agricultural fertility, which resulted in economic security for the outlying population. Some of these rituals are portrayed in the stone sculpture of La Venta. Others are suggested by the architectural design. An entryway into the court at its northeast corner offers support for this conjecture. Through it may have come ceremonial processions or sacrificial victims or outlying maize farmers bringing tribute for the touchy gods of fertility. Dramatic evidence of one such rite came to light on the western edge of the northeast platform. As the court floor was being excavated toward the center line, a group of figurines and celts made an unexpected appearance. From earliest exposure, it could be seen that they were arranged in a deliberate pattern. Carefully cleared of ancient sand, the heads displayed typical Olmec facial representation. Thick lips, slanting eyes, deformed skulls. At last, the group stood fully revealed six jade celts and sixteen figurines, thirteen made of serpentine, two of jade, and one of granite. This one is backed against a row of celts, which might be construed as a miniature palisade. Before him pass a file of four, facing in the direction of a very haughty, authoritative figure. The remaining figurines, arranged in a semicircle, appear to be watching the scene. An important ceremony is obviously taking place. The haughty person seems to be the central character. Is he priest or visiting dignitary? The lone granite figurine may be a special personage, such as a captive. The file of four advancing toward the central figure could be acolytes or dancers or sacrificial victims. Their human counterparts may have been escorted into the court through the northeast entryway. Interpretation of the surrounding strata revealed a curious fact. 
about 100 years after the figurines were buried, a hole was cut through the court floors exactly to the level of their heads. Someone who knew precisely where to find the group evidently looked in, then simply refilled the hole. What records were kept at Leventa so that long after the burial of an offering, it could be unerringly located? Levanta's most challenging structures were the court's two southern platforms. 1943 explorations in the southeast platform yielded an enormous mosaic mask representing the face of a jaguar, the favorite Olmec deity. The platform itself consisted of unfired yellow adobe bricks laid in red clay mortar. The outlines of a small exploratory test pit dug in 1942 were still visible. At the phase three level, another series of facing blocks was exposed. Upon the stratigraphic control wall, the layers of fills and floors made their appearance. The 16th and final layer of adobe bricks rested at the level of the white sandy floors of phase two. A massive fill of pink clay was next encountered. Five feet below the top of this fill, some dressed serpentine blocks began to emerge. It soon became apparent, as mouth, eyes, and headdress plumes appeared, that another mosaic representation of a jaguar was being uncovered. The control wall was now removed, and the jaguar mask lay fully exposed for the first time in over 2,000 years. It consisted of 485 carefully cut and smoothed serpentine blocks, an almost exact duplicate of the one found 12 years earlier in the twin platform to the east. Typically, the creators had worked on a large scale, covering an area of 15 by 20 feet. They had incorporated most of the conventional features found in other Olmec representations of the jaguar. The headdress is made up of four feathered plumes, the centers of the appendages filled with yellow clay. Four eyes are depicted, rather than the two eyes commonly found in Olmec portrayals of the jaguar. The eyebrows are plumed in the customary style. The nose is a narrow vertical panel. The mouth agape and filled with cinnamon-colored sand. In its day, before the millennia had obscured the color and polish of the serpentine, the mask must have been one of the most splendid offerings ever laid down at Leventa.
sang a song of charming you. I sing a song of charming you. I'm a famous anthropologist, and this is the famous and mysterious Mayan calendar, which many people believe predicts the end of the world in the year 2012. But those people are stupid. Smart we know how frustrating it can be when you can't find a direct and detailed answer. It seems like nobody understands what you're going through. So if you don't find exactly what you need, then don't worry. Simply contact our friendly team. We'll fulfill your requirements and explain the options and how we work. We promise that we'll maintain the highest level of customer care and commitment. All of our work is carried out to assured standards and we'll complete everything efficiently, leaving you with great results. Our friendly and knowledgeable team is waiting to solve your unique requirements. So please, don't hesitate to contact us let us prove our commitment to your satisfaction. We're here to help, so contact us today. Speaks to your eyes 